opportunity to be uh, standing before you on uh, this morning. If this is your first time visiting this congregation, we welcome you here and we pray that uh, if you have questions about anything that has been said or done during our worship service, uh, that you please ask uh, those questions. On this morning, I want to turn your attention to John chapter 5. John chapter 4. I want to thank you for welcoming our family uh, to be with you uh, on today. John chapter 5. I'll begin reading in verse 1 where the Bible says, After this there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting <laughs> for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. And there was a certain man there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been there for a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will you be made whole? The impotent man answered, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Verse 9, immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. I find it interesting that Jesus, who was coming in to Jerusalem for the feast day, took time to go by this pool. Jesus already knew that there would be many who were there that were impotent. Another word for impotent is paralyzed. Uh, and many who were there that was blind and withered. When we as Christians come to the house of worship, do we uh, have in our mind any regard for those who are less fortunate than we are. We have to realize that Jesus was all, always operating on a higher level uh, from a spiritual standpoint. So he took the time to go to this area in order that he might visit those who were sick. The word impotent or paralyzed in this text uh, uh, means that uh, there were people who were there that were without strength. There were multitudes of people that were there without strength. They did not all have the same problem, yet they were all without strength. When you look at this story, I believe that there is a deeper message and a deeper concern on the part of Jesus than those who are physically without strength. Luke 19 and 10, uh, Jesus says, I am come to seek and to save those who are lost. Jesus came uh, that he might demonstrate to the world that he has the power and the ability to save man from his sins. And so I am glad to know today that Jesus shows his love to me and he cares about me. See, we live in a world that is sick. All you have to do is turn on the news every day and you will see what I'm talking about. We live in a sick world. We live in a world of spiritually paralyzed people. Regardless as to how good 
good you look and how strong you seem to be. All of us are sick and without strength. And now there's a physical weaknesses. There are physical weaknesses uh, that some have to deal with uh, that have a way of draining the life out of us. Amen. Many face uh, physical challenges that they can't seem to overcome. But then there's a moral part of us that is also without strength. This is clearly seen every day when we listen and watch the news. Amen. When we hear stories like this, it shows that there is a weakness morally in our society. And the question of life that you pray to God Lord, is there any hope or is there any help for me in this situation? It may be my son, it may be my daughter, it may be a friend or a neighbor, it may be you and I. All the cases that were there, that's how Jesus is. And the Bible says there was a man who had a physical weakness for 38 years. John says that this man was gripped. He was held firmly. He was caught up in his dilemma. Now, this is one of the seven signs of Jesus Christ that is mentioned in the book of John. John 20 says, and many other signs truly did Jesus do in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and in believing you may have life in his name. Now, in John chapter 2, Jesus turns the water into wine. That was his first miracle. Today, we're talking about his third miracle. The first miracle, when Jesus uh, turned the water into wine, that dealt with quality. This one deals with time. It's hopeless. When Jesus asked him the question in verse 6 of John 5, will you be made whole? He says in verse 7, he begins to make excuses. He says, well, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. You mean you don't have any uh, family? You don't have any friends that's interested enough in you to help and to aid you to get into this pool? This man then replies, he says, Hurt, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming down, another steps before me. This shows this man is in a hopeless situation. The second reason I believe that Jesus asked him this question was to reveal his heart. Now, he's in a hopeless situation. Now, Jesus wants to look at his heart. He says, I see you at this pool. I know you've been here for 38 years, but what is your mental state? Do you feel sorry for yourself? Do you wish to use this as a crutch to gain sympathy and to receive handouts from those who come near you? Do you have a determination? Do you want to better yourself? What's your heart condition? What's your disposition? Do you want to be made whole today? See, not only does Jesus reveal that this man is hopeless, not only does he reveal his heart, but then this is how Jesus works. Jesus reveals the fact that there is hope. See, Jesus would not have asked the question if Jesus did not have something to offer him. And I believe this lame man knew that for Jesus to ask me this question, he must know something that I don't. He must have something that I don't have. He must be planning to help me to get into this pool. So this interaction between the lame man and Jesus brought about a renewed hope on the part of this lame man. Can you imagine 38 years of your life, no one was there to help this man to get into this pool. But now Jesus comes and he asks him, do you want to be made whole? Now I believe that there are many of us here today, we have problems. Paul says in Romans, all have sinned. We can't point the finger and say, y'all have sinned, right? All have sinned. We all have shortcomings. We all have problems that we deal with. And the question I want to pose to us today is, do we really 
really want to be made whole? Do we want a better quality of life spiritually? Paul says in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. Sin starts out, it's very appealing. The devil will make it look so good to you. Satan knows what you like. It starts out pleasurable, but sin has an agenda. Satan has an agenda. Distract, deceive, destroy. That's the agenda of the devil. And, and, and it, it is to blind us. It is to cripple us. It is to destroy us. But I believe, I, I have a heart that just truly believes that every person wants to be whole. Proverbs 11, verse 19 says, As righteousness tends to life, so he that pursues evil pursues it to his own death. If we continue by choice to stay in evil, we will spiritually die. See, we need the help of Jesus in our life because, listen, we cannot help ourselves. That's why Jesus says, I have to go so that I can send my spirit who is the comforter to you. And here's what's interesting. <coughs> Jesus didn't come to this lame man and tell him, I'm going to help you to get into this pool. Look at verse 8 of John chapter 5. Jesus gives three commands to this man. He says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. There are, these are three commands. See, a lot of times with us as human beings, we don't want to follow the process. We cannot walk without crawling first. See, when the Lord comes to us and he knows that we have problems and we need healing. See, the church needs healing. The church of Christ needs healing today uh, because we've gone through a lot in our time. Over uh, 2,500 congregations have closed within the last 20 years. We need some healing. Right? And we know we have problems. But we cannot walk without crawling first. We want to get up and we want to just start walking immediately. If babies came out of the womb just walking, then it would all amaze us, wouldn't it? Right? But they have to take steps. They have to crawl and bump their heads a little bit. And then when they begin walking, we can't ever catch up with them. Amen. But there's a process to our spiritual healing. What is that? Get up, rise, and then walk. That tells me that the Lord has a process for my healing. When you talk about this idea of rising, when Jesus tells this lame man to rise, that's a relational response. How do you say that, preacher? Because this lame man had been by this pool for 38 years. Do you believe that he ever tried or had a desire to get up before? What makes it so different now for a stranger like Jesus to come to him and say, rise, take up your bed and walk? I'll tell you how today. Somehow this man had to put his faith and his trust in the Jesus Christ who stood before him. What would our response would have been if we were this lame man in the same condition? Well, Jesus, I tried to get up before, and uh, I just couldn't get up. Jesus didn't say that he's going to help you to get up. He just said, get up. Rise. When he, uh, uh, when he called for Lazarus from the dead, he had to specifically say, Lazarus, come forth. If he would have just said, come forth, everybody would have came forth. He had to make it specific. Lazarus was his friend. And so he says, Lazarus, come forth. This lame man put faith in Jesus. Hebrews 11 and 1. Now, now faith. Now faith. I want that to resonate with you today. Now faith. Not faith that I uh, brush under the rug. Now faith is the substance.
substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, for 38 years, I want you to picture that in your mind this morning. This man had not seen his ability to walk. He thought it was done. But now, all of a sudden, the Lord says, get up, rise. He immediately gets up. Now, if that's not faith, I, 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 I truly don't know what faith is. He had to put trust in the words of Jesus. He says, I get up. And then he says, if I tell you to get up, then you're going to get up. It wasn't just anybody telling this lame man to rise. It wasn't the doctor. It wasn't even his mother or his father. It was the creator of the universe. Jesus says, put your faith in me. <clears throat> Not only did he tell this man to rise, which was a relational response, he says, take up your bed. Now, I wonder why Jesus tells him to take up his bed. Now, the concept of this is uh, uh, a relational as well, but it's also provisional. In other words, Jesus says, not only do I want a relationship with you, but I'm going to make provisions for you not to go back by that pool where you came from. You see, once I get you up, my man, I don't want you to go back. This bed reminds you of 38 years of sickness and disease. Fold up your mat. You don't need it anymore. Then I want you to walk in the newness of life. I don't want you staying around this pool anymore. Walk, in other words, move. Jesus did that by spoken word to this lame man. Now listen, uh, we live in a world today where uh, uh, false prophets exist. See, God is, uh, uh, God was performing uh, instant miracles back then. But God is not performing instant miracles today. But the same God who uh, performed miracles for this lame man, he will do special things in your life, but we need to have faith and trust in him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, <coughs> acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. <coughs> we have to follow the process, though. There is a process for this. Mark 4, 28 is a text that is so powerful to me. I'm going to quote this to you. Uh, it has to do with the concept of farming. Mark 4.28 says, For the earth brings forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. That's a process. If we can see that in the physical, that there's a process for when we plant seeds, uh, then those seeds then begin to sprout, and then they begin to form. Back in Indiana, where I'm from, a, a corn is the, the crop of Indiana, basically. Uh, and so uh, when I look at it now, I look at it from a different perspective. I look at it spiritually, uh, because it tells us that, uh, that there is a process. We cannot bypass the process. John 5, 14, after Jesus tells this man to rise and to take up this bed and to walk. Listen at this uh, a text here in John 5, 14. Afterwards, Jesus finds him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, you are made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. This lame man was at the pool among others who were without strength, that were blind, that were halt, that were withered. Jesus gives him new life and he starts walking. He folded up his mat and when the Lord found him, he found him in the church house. Oh, I love that. Uh, because that's where the place of healing is. Yes. 
See, our churches ought to be full because our world is sick. But people find so many things and, and so many things to get else to get involved with instead of coming to the house of the Lord and they'll be the first ones to say, oh, preacher, pray for me. I need prayer. I'm sick. My family's sick. Uh, uh, will you pray for my neighbor? Will you pray for my friend? Well, all you got to do is come to the house of the Lord. Of the Lord. You will find all of that. See, when the Lord gives you new life and he brings healing to your situation, you ought to find yourself in the house of the Lord. In other words, Jesus was saying to this man, you are made whole. You are made well. You are sound. You are safe. It's nothing like getting a peaceful night's rest. Amen. I don't care what's going on around me. I can sleep at night. Why? Because I know the presence of the Lord is upon me. And I have newfound joy in my life. And Jesus says to him, go and sin no more. And today I want to ask you, brothers and sisters and friends, uh, to consider what Jesus says to this lame man. He says, rise. That's relational. Take up your bed. That's provisional. And walk. We need a relationship with the Lord. The most important relationship that you will ever have is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing else matters. Take up your bed. See, God already knows the end from the beginning. As humans, we work from beginning to end. God doesn't work that way. He works in from beginning. Revelations 3 and 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and die. Now, I want you to picture a door with no knob on the outside. The only knob is on the inside, and you have to open the door. Because Jesus said, I am standing at the door, and I'm knocking at the door. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and I will sup with him, and he with me. That's how Jesus works. He said, I'm not going to force my way into your life. You have to let me in. I want, I want to be your Savior and your Lord, but I'm not going to force my way into your life. You have to let me in. Verse 21 of Revelation 3, To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. We are overcomers. We can be made whole, brothers and sisters, when we recognize the process, receive Jesus, and have a relationship with him. That's the concept of rise. Number two, take up your bed. Now, now, my wife is she's a, she's in mental health, and, and you know she's very gifted uh, uh, at that. Uh, she has a very special craft. And, and sometimes uh, she has to deal with uh, uh, certain uh, people that have to overcome things. So uh, she may have to deal with an alcoholic, right? Uh, so Jesus tells this blind, tells this lame man, rise, take up your bed. So we already know that uh, Jesus says, I don't want you to go back there. Right? So, so sometimes we have to say, if alcohol or drugs is, 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 is causing me uh, in my, uh, causing me a rift between my relationship with the Lord, I need to stay away from that. And Jesus tells this man, stay away from this fool. It reminds you of sickness and disease. I don't want you to go back there. Then he says, after you do that, I want you to walk in the newness of life. Some of the most powerful testimonies that I've heard from people are of people who overcame sickness, <coughs> diseases, uh, alcoholism, drugs, prostitution. Those are some of the most powerful testimonies. And when we follow the process, brothers and sisters, watch how God will strengthen you. He will take you to places that you've never been before. 
He will make you useful in the kingdom of God. And today I will ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I do because I don't have anywhere else to turn. I know that in my life I've been spiritually crippled and blind and haunted. I know I can't make it in this world by myself. That's why I need Jesus. And we all need him. We all need him. You cannot go through this life without a higher power than Jesus in your life. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. The yoke that Jesus is talking about here, the yoke back in biblical times was a harness that was placed on two animals with the same one. So in other words, I would not put a yoke on a cow and a pig. They don't have the same walk. Jesus says, take my yoke because, see, I know that your walk is not like my walk. So you need to put my yoke upon you so that now we can walk together. He says, take my yoke upon you and what? Learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen. Will you be made whole today? You have to rise, take up your bed, and walk. If you're listening to me today, and you're not a Christian, how do I become a Christian? Uh, you may be sitting there asking yourself, and every time I get a chance to deliver the message from the Word of God, I want to extend the invitation because somebody may be listening that doesn't know the Lord, and they want to know the Lord in the pardon of their sins. How do I become a Christian on today? You hear the gospel. I've given you a snippet from the Word of God today. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to make a change in your mind that says no to sin and yes to God? That's repentance. Acts 17 and 30 says, at, you know, in Acts 17, uh, uh, they were dealing with false gods and false idols. And God had to come in and interrupt their program and say, at the time of this ignorance, God knew that. But now, he commands all men everywhere to repent. You must repent. Repentance is changed. It's a 180. I cannot continue to walk in the same direction. That I <clears throat> Will you just stand before this audience today and confess Jesus as the Son of God verbally with your mouth? Jesus says this in Matthew 10, 32. If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father God. Will we all make the confession of faith to become Christians? Jesus then turned to his Father. It says, Jerry, you confess Christ. Jerry, you confess Christ. That's what he will do. But we have to make that confession of faith verbally with our God. We'll baptize you today for the remission of sins. What is baptism? Baptism is a reenacting of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again. And you may be sitting there pondering and wondering, how do I read and act that? When you make a decision that you want to become a Christian, you are making the decision that you're going to die from the old lifestyle. That's your death. When we baptize you, the Greek word for baptism, baptizo, means burial. We bury you in the liquid way where God is washing away all of your sins. So we have your death, we have your burial, and when you come up out of the water, that's your resurrection. That's your new life in Christ. So listen, baptism is essential to your salvation today because we are reenacting. The same thing that Jesus did when he went to the cross of Calvary. So if that is your desire today and you want to become a Christian, 11.03 on a Sunday morning is a mighty good time to give your life to the Lord today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's all be standing.